Brethren in Christ, laudator Jesus Christus in secula. This is Timothy Flanders at the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. And I'm joined today by my friend, Patrick O'Hearn. Patrick, how you doing, brother? Doing well. Thanks. Thanks be to God. And thank you for having me. If you don't know Patrick, he is a husband and father. He's authored and co-authored seven books. And I think we have an eight book, too, to talk about. Um, so there's Parents of the Saints. That's one we're going to talk about today. Nursery of Heaven, co-author, The Shepherd at the Crib and the Cross. And I think both of those are kids' books, right? Um, and then there's... there's Nursery, uh, of he- Nursery of Heaven is an adult one, but uh, okay. Shepherd at the Crib and the Cross is a children's book. Yeah. Okay, and then Our Lady of Sorrows is your new kids' book that we'll, we'll talk about as well. Um, and you also have The Grief of Dads and The Courtship of the Saints. And... Uh, his subject interests include lives of the saints in the interior life. He holds a master's in education from Franciscan. And you can visit his website at patrickrohern.com. So we're going to be talking about this text, Parents of the Saints. And I just want to introduce everyone to this particular series at Meaning of Catholic is called The Lay Apostolate. And it's all about being a lay person. And it, it features two parents of the saints. First, there's Joachim and Anne. Joachim and Anne are kissing. That's the icon of the Immaculate Conception. So the the parents of the Virgin Mary, and then uh, obviously Mary and Joseph being betrothed. So it's it's this is all about being a layperson. So uh, before we get into that topic, um, Patrick, tell us about your latest projects. Patrick R O Hearn is the website. There's a a different Patrick O'Hearn I discovered, some kind of musician. I'm sure you. Yeah, he's, a, he's a new age guy, so I got. Oh no! <laughs> I got to pray for his conversion. You know, I mean, I guess my name could have been like Michael Bolton, or you know, I mean, it could have been worse. So I know I'm grateful for it to be named after Saint Patrick, but uh, there is. There a, we go. So make sure saying. you put the R for Rob. I don't know. What I just R- said, for, R- uh, for Ryan. Ryan. Yeah, Ryan. Ryan there we go. So Patrick R. O'Hearn. So yeah, tell us about your latest projects, Patrick. Yes, yeah, so I. I have the latest book that's coming out in um, February is Our Lady of Sorrows. It's a children's book by Sophia Press, and I was able to have um, you know Father Rippinger write the foreword for it. And uh, he has a few prayers in there for children that he wrote specifically for this book. You know, a prayer for their vocation, a bit prayer for protection, and then so I go through each of the seven sorrows, and Our Lady speaks to the you know to the child through those meditations. And then there's uh, at the end of the book, there's different prayers in English and Latin for children. So it's uh, I think you'll love the illustrator. She's um, she's uh, written a book for, I think Tan, it was like uh, Santu, 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 a so Latin missile for children. Oh just to, yeah. That one is really good. I really yeah. like that one. So you I will love her. her illus- yeah. Her illustrations are just, oh, you know, as you can see by the front cover there, I mean, you know, I think a lot of our children's books, we just, we tend to dumb down the message. And I think it's, you know, I've had um, just in my time, I, I would love to write more adult books, but I've, I found like I can crank out more children's books and uh, they're less stressful on the wife. So uh, that, mm-hmm. that's why I've been kind of doing that right now. Well, that, that, well, we're, we're, we're all about the lay concern. So I understand that. Um, I wanted to mention this other, where is it? Um, oh, we should talk about this one too. I, I wanted to mention that, but I wanted to, um, yeah, this is, this is the one that I, I was very appreciative. I, you wrote an article about the grief of dads and, um, so it's support and hope for Catholic fathers navigating child loss. What a important topic that does not get covered. Tell us about this book. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I co-authored this with a few gentlemen, one of my friends, uh, Brian Fager, who lost uh, three children from miscarriage. And then Kelly and Ryan Bro, they're involved in um, Redbird Ministries. And it's a, it's the largest Catholic organization to help f- fathers and mothers a child lost. They're based in Louisiana. And so this book, what we wanted to do in, in here is identify, you know, grief. What, what is grief? And we want to talk about, you know, there's several, we went through the scripture, different saints, male saints, and, and that lost children. And, and then we have stories. I have my story in there from miscarriage. And then we have a story of a stillbirth story of all the way up to adults. So we have a gentleman um, that lost one of his sons in war. You know, these are all Catholic stories. And I think it's, it's so important because divorce is so rampant with child loss and we don't identify that battle. And uh, just, you know, when the father is suffering, 
you know, the whole family suffers and often, you know, they're overlooked, you know, the wife is, you know, and rightly so she's grieving, but often dads or people will come up to, you know, they'd come up to me and be like, how's your wife doing? And, and anyways, this book is a resource. There's also a lot of prayers in here. And uh, we even have Joseph Pierce's story. You know, many, many people know that he had a stillbirth daughter and he said uh, his story is just phenomenal in there. So he, you know, anyway, so this book is a, you know, just, it's the first time anyone's really written a book to help men of child loss. That's good. I, I'm so happy that you wrote this, especially because men, we often have less emotional intelligence than our wives who are very much in touch with their emotions. We just have a lot more trouble and grief is one of the most powerful, overwhelming emotions as well. So uh, one last thing before we get into our topic, uh, tell us about this important text um, with uh, one of my favorites, Father Calloway. I'm, I'm a big fan of his Joseph Consecration. I've gone through that book. Um, and obviously an important text for right now. Tell us about the yeah. Eucharistic Revival book. Yeah, so St. Peter Julian Amor is probably one of my top five favorite saints. You know, he was a French priest, good friend of St. John Vianney, and they call him the Apostle of the Eucharist. And so several years ago, I had started this manuscript and ended up collaborating with Father Calloway. So I'm, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a contributor to the book and, uh, but we set it up. We had, it's a retreat and, uh, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal book. It's a short little book. It's probably about 160 pages. I have, I have the copy here, but I love some of the themes. I mean, so we, we start with, uh, like each day there's a reflection in blue, oh, sorry, from, on this side, from St. Peter Julian Amart sorry, his actual words. And then we have father writes a reflection and then there's a resolution. And then there's, um, there's a certain prayer. And then I had this, um, at the end of the book, there's a translation of the litany of the Holy Eucharist that was written like 200 years ago. So you'll pray that each day you'll rotate between that prayer and the litany of the most precious blood. And it's, uh, I think this book is just, I mean, some of the topics, you know, reparation, Mary's interior life. And so these are all, you know, again, some of the best nuggets that I found from St. Peter, Julian Amar. And, uh, and I think you'll love it with, with obviously with Father Calloway. He's hard hitting, talks about communion in the tongue, communion on the tongue, and then putting the tabernacle back. So he doesn't mince any words when he writes this book. Well, that, that's very exciting. And obviously a critical topic of today. So yeah. um I, I'm excited about Parents of the Saints, and the reason is because I, I, some of the, one of the things that I tell people all the time is that the triumph of Holy Church, the liberty and exaltation of Holy Church, will come. It's a certain fact. We know it. It'll come in the end, or soon, or who knows when. But perhaps not in our lifetime. Perhaps our children or our children's children, and. What, what about if we worry ourselves and, you know, uh, busy ourselves with making our children saints? Uh, this is a, such an exciting topic. Um, so where did you first start yeah. thinking about wanting to write this Parents yeah. of the Saints book? And I want to show, actually, so the first edition sold out. And so I actually, my long, long story, it got a new facelift. So I wanted to match. I just want to show you real quick. So people are confused because they see your copy. And I kind of like this copy. So this is a picture of um, Blessed Jane, you know, uh, St. Dominic's mother on the front cover before the Blessed Sacrament. So anyways, that's, and that kind of matches this other one from Tan. So just if you're if people saw your first cover, I, we did change the cover. And uh, what, I don't know what edition I have. It's so like, you got the first edition one. Oh, this is the first edition. Okay. Yeah, so, that's so you one. got the first it edition. Have parents on it. So I that's guess that's right. <laughs> so I originally self published that book. And then, oh, okay. Tan, you know, when I, I ended up working at Tan for two years and then they decided they wanted to pick it up. And, uh, anyways, but you have, so you have the first edition. But so the, the reason, um, I decided, and, and this one's a little long, it's 500 pages long. So the typesetting got changed a little bit. So, uh, but, but don't let that scare you. So, well, is, is the content pretty, pretty this yeah, similar, is. or is it? It is. Yeah, I made a few changes. Nothing really, you know. I, okay. Obviously, in any book, when you first have your first book, there's always a few errors you find in there. It's normal, and then. Oh, this, this was your first book. Patrick? That was so. It was the first book I started writing, but there was okay. the second one that got published. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, this book I felt well, I was just recently married, and um, three months into my marriage, and I really just it was kind of like the Holy Spirit out of nowhere. Just, I just felt this inspiration, you know, write this book. 
and I, I, I wrote it to help me, you know, I wanted to be the best father that I could be best husband. And often, you know, I grew up reading all the lives of the saints. And uh, after I got married, I was like, I couldn't identify that much with as, as much as I used to with like St. Therese or St. Francis, because, you know, they took a vow of celibacy. And so I was like, how did, how did, how were they formed? And so that led me on a dive of, um, you know, over three years, just researching and writing on them. And I kind of, what I do instead of, you know, you have these biographies that are great with, with saints and it's like you read one saint and you go to the next. But what I want to do is identify seven hallmarks of parents. And these hallmarks came to me as I was reading the lives of the saints. So, you know, so they pass it on to their children. And these seven hallmarks are, um, you know, the first one is the sacramental life, which is the most important hallmark. So, you know, basically this whole book is just, I include a lot of stories in there. If you want to interject there, but I can go through all the seven hallmarks real quick, just so I have the sacramental life. Yeah, go ahead. And I, you know, I tell stories of St. Gianna's parents, you know, uh, St. Therese, just their, their parents' devotion to the Blessed Sacrament, and then all the different sacraments per se. And then I, I the next one I go into is, uh, I may not have the correct order, but the sacrificial love. I go into surrender, suffering, simplicity, solitude. And the sacredness of life. So those are the seven hallmarks. As you know, you know most of the saints they came from large families. Um, so yeah, I kind of hi highlight that a little bit. This is great. So you you started writing this three months into your marriage. So you probably were not a father yet, or maybe you were a father in Utah. I don't know. But uh, now you have how many children? So Patrick? we have yeah we have two on earth and two in heaven. Okay. Right? Yeah. Thanks be to God. I have four. I have two in heaven. That yeah. as well. Um, so the um, so it, one of the things that has been occupying my father mind very often right now is that my seven-year-old is going to make his first Holy Communion this, this year. And um, one of the things that a, a friend, another father told me was that the best way to teach them the real presence is to uh, do it yourself as a father um, and so I, I've been trying to bring my children just to like that, you know, five, 10 minute adoration time with the little, little kids and then just show them just worship Jesus and blessed sacrament. And then they see that. And I, I hope that that inculcates something to them. So tell us about that aspect, uh, mm -hmm. teaching the, the parents, teaching the children, the particular dogma of the real presence. Yeah. There's a few points in there. And, and one of them was obviously it began even before St. Therese was born, you know, her, her mother, who, parents who I feature the most in my book, probably because I have a great devotion in them, but also there's a lot of writing on them, but you know, they would go make visits to the blessed sacrament. And then after St. Therese's um, mother died, St. Therese was around four. Zelly, you know, after Zelly passed away, Louis, you know, they moved to Lisieux and he would go on walks, daily walks. They go, they could walk to the church and they would take, he would take Therese on with him, and to uh, make a visit to the Blessed Sacrament. And even during Mass, St. Therese would often see her father in tears when he was here in the homily. And so that kind of struck, you know, resonated with Therese, like, you know, my father believes. And interesting, so since St. Louis Martin is a saint, I, sh I need to research his father, right? So his father was in the military, and he would, after communion, he would make um, about a 10 or 15 minute thanksgiving after mass ended and even his soldiers would chide him and he's like why are you here he goes it's because i believe i believe in it and so those are just a few examples uh, another story was uh, you know saint gianna's parents they would go to daily mass they lived by a capuchin friary so the father would get up there's two masses in the morning he would get up really early around 5 30 and go to mass and then he'd you know, go off to work and then um, saint gianna's mother would wake up the children and then they would go to, you know, like an eight o'clock mass. And so you just see that, you know, not, not everyone can go to daily mass, but I, I think if you can't go to daily mass, it's like, you know, at least make spiritual communions, you know, go visit the blessed sacrament, you know, at least, I mean, once a week at the minimum, you know, during the weekday. Um, so I think that those are, those are some of the, you know, the, the reverence that you see with these parents. That's beautiful. Um, it's something that I has always struck with me is seeing my own father pray. That's definitely just seeing him. I know that children, especially very young children, learn by imitation. They see people doing things they want to imitate, mm -hmm. especially parents. 
Uh, one, the hallmark that struck me a lot though was solitude because obviously parents are married. So they see their children, you know, children see their parents together a lot. Um, tell us about solitude. Yeah. You know, I have a, a story in there with, you know, San Alfonso de la Gori, you know, who one of the greatest saints and his father would often take him on retreats with him. And I, I just think what a beautiful example, you know, we, we take our children to, you know, NFL, a lot of dads will take their children to like a football game. It's like, you know, you take them all these different places, but it's like, why not take your son on a retreat? So that was one story in there. Uh, the other one that probably the most famous story, um, you, you probably know this story, Tim, too, is, you know, when John Paul II, after 50 years of his priesthood, you know, he reflected upon his own priesthood, but he, he recalls the instant when he woke up in the middle of the night, his father was on his knees praying. And uh, he goes, you know, my father was like my first seminary. And I, I think that, that that element of solitude and the, another story is St. Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows, great passionist, uh, religious brother. His father was the mayor of Assisi. And it was said that he would wake up every morning and pray for an hour before his duties. And, and I often think the more responsibilities we have in life, you know, often it's like the last thing we do is pray. But really, it's the more things we have on our plate that means we need to make more time for prayer. Yeah. Too busy not to pray. Um, I, yeah, I love that. The story of, uh, Carol Wojtyla senior. It's one of my favorite stories is the, how he, after, um, after his wife died and how he would, um, read the Bible with his son and, and, and all this, um, Tell us about some uh, saints that are, you have quite a few uh, saints that I, I've not really familiar with or haven't even heard of, actually. Yeah. So tell us about any lesser known saints that um, that you learned about in this, or parents of those saints, rather. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think. You know, it's funny, when I wrote this three years ago, I always, I, it's like, I forget, like, who, what I, you know, I'm sure when you get interviewed, you're like, what did I, who did I put in there? But I think some of the lesser known ones, let's see, that I had in here. And bear with me. Is there any ones in particular that that you had that? Um, well, we've got uh, Kowalska. Who's that? Uh, is that okay? Oh, yeah. So that is Saint. Fa okay, that's Saint Faustina, Faustina, right? Oh, okay, right, right. So yeah. Saint Stanislaus and Mariana Kowalska. Tell yeah. us about them. Yeah. What I what I found in my research about them is interesting. You know, they didn't want Faustina to go in the convent, and it was. It was because she was their their most obedient, and their, their, I know parents aren't supposed to have favorite children, right? But she was their favorite. She was, and uh, and she was the only one. Another thing that I found out, she was the only one that knew where the shotgun was at. So that's how. Oh, no, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but her, her father was he was a holy man, and Faustina, after she was in final vows, she was visiting her parents, and she talks about this in her diary. And she goes, she saw, she's like, if I she felt the shame that she could not pray like her father. So I was like, how did her father pray? Well, every morning he would wake up and he would sing these hymns to our lady. And they lived in a, you know, it was basically a one bedroom house and it irritated Faustina's mother so much. And, and I just, I was, I was like, hey, at least he, he probably should have went outside or whatever, but he would say <laughs> his prayers out loud. And, uh, but just, I think that, you know, they were simple people. I think they had like 10 acres. They lived on a farm and uh, you know, just, I think that they taught their daughter, you know, the value she was, she was prepared for religious life from this detachment, you know, and we live in this age where children get everything for Christmas. And, and that's why I think you see these saints, cause there's a level of poverty there. And, and I, I was blessed several, this was like back in March to meet with father Rippinger when he was speaking in, in uh, North Carolina. And I wanted to know about his own dad and, you know, and his dad was a mechanic and you can find his fault, his homily for his father online on YouTube. Oh yeah. And, right. And, and I think the fact that father Rippinger and, you know, I'm not canonizing him yet, but I mean, just, you know, the level of holiness is, you know, he, he grew up in a home that, you know, maybe lower middle, middle income to lower middle income. And I just think that there's something to be said about, um, again, just this level of um, simplicity. And that's, that's a hallmark that I had that these saints were prepared for their vocations um, from their youth. Yeah. And I remember Father Ripperger mentioning something about, uh, my, my father worked three jobs or something so that my, my mom could raise us and all this. And, um, uh, here's one that I, I saw under suffering Nicola and Dranafile 
Bojack Siu. Who are the who are they? Yeah. So those are the parents of Saint Mother Teresa. Oh and, yeah, yeah. And her her father, they believe, was actually poisoned to death. He was very you know, very oh, devout. No. He um, he almost was he almost was too involved in politics in a sense, but he, <clears throat> he was a very zealous man and he came home one night and died, you know, and uh, Mother Teresa was very young. But her mother was very, you know, just the things that you see in Mother Teresa, like why did why did she go take care of the poor? That was that seed was planted at her home. Her mother would actually um, go and bathe. This there's this alcoholic woman that had sores all over her body. So again, Mother Teresa, the missionaries of charity were born in the home of Mother Teresa. You know, in in her childhood from her own mother. I just found. Um, oh, so this I, I okay. The parents of Saint Ignatius of Loyola, Beltran and Mariana de onyas yep. so you have them under sacredness of life yeah tell us they, about those yes guys. i have to double check they had uh, i believe it was 16 children wow and Ign ignatius was the youngest and i i make a little note well, in there yeah, it's 13 it's 13 13 13 <laughs> good you know i joke i mean you know it's you know, I, that's that's a reminder to all our jesuit institutions to remember you know <laughs> you know like hey who's your fat your founder would it wouldn't be alive today you know if, <laughs> if his parents were doing contraceptive contraception uh but he was the youngest and uh you know i i wanted to also highlight you know mother angelica said i wish many years in purgatory to people who sugarcoat the lives of the saints so in these stories i I want to mention things that they failed at too, just because it's, you know, we, we see these saints with like, oh man, I can never be like that. But uh, Ignatius's father was sadly, he was a womanizer and that's what kind of led Ignatius into that path. But, you know, there were some good things they did. They had Catholic books in their home. So all wasn't lost, but uh, I, I think that, you know, the fact that his parents were open to life. And I think that's an example for all of us Catholic parents. Oh, that, that's beautiful. Uh, how, god brings out a saint even if the father's not so good uh thanks be to god for that um i think i just found a saint that was um i've got companionis and amata de guaruti um and i don't i don't know even know i don't know who this is i don't know which saint this is for this is for it was in 1245 so tell us about that yep who is that for so that one is let me pull that up here okay so for oh, those of nicholas of tolentino yeah it's, i'm so not familiar is, with him yeah so he is the patron of i, I believe a purgatory and I, I think i put that story in there because they were having difficulties with uh you know fertility getting pregnant and so they actually prayed to saint nicholas and so that's oh, why beautiful the son was named after him and it's such an important lesson, you know. I think it was December twenty, uh, just the other day, right? Two days ago was the feast of Saint Dominic Silos, a famous bishop. And Saint Dominic's mother went to pray at his church, and I think at his body. And I think she even had a dream. She obviously had a dream, but some kind of communication with Saint Dominic Silos. They said, "You're going to have another child," and so they named their son after him. So I, I think if there's one lesson too that I, I think in this book, it's kind of subtle, but. You know, when naming your children after saint, I mean, it's important to name your children after saints, but like to call upon them, especially if you're having difficulty getting pregnant or um, because these saints want to help. That's great. Now, we, we've talked mainly about mostly modern saints. Uh, we just hit on um, sort of Middle Ages. Uh, do you have any Reformation parents during that era of the Protestant revolt? I would have, you know... I'm trying to think. Teresa of Avila would she be considered? Oh yeah. That? yeah okay. Yeah. Yeah. Her 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 parents. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the good things that they did. Her mother was like just a, a beautiful woman, and just very, I think again she died young. Um, I, I do notice. I guess one of the things on on like the, obviously the rosary was very important to her childhood. There's a few things I, I did highlighted mistakes that they made that Teresa of Avila. Uh, comments about is, you know, she had a cousin that was basically very um, rotten and, and that, and her parents did not protect her well enough from that cousin. And so she, you know, undergo, undertook like a, almost like she became vain because of that cousin. And I think I put that in there 
to show parents like, you know, you have to really watch your children, not only their friends, but sometimes it can be even the, the relatives, the cousins that can influence. Um, so she's mentioned in there. Um, I also had John of the Cross's parents and, and John of the Cross's father was basically renounced from his family because he chose to marry a lower class woman. And I, again, what an example. And his father died young. John of the Cross, I think, was like two years old, hardly knew his father. But just to have that legacy, to know that his own dad was willing to sacrifice everything for true love, that that gave him, you know, the hope that he was able to suffer for Christ and be forsaken by even his own order. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, now, any parents in the first millennium going back further, uh, what are some parents of the saints that stick out to you in the, in the first thousand years? First thousand years. Now, these are good questions. I, you're, you know, I'm not a history. <laughs> history. Let me, let me see who I have. If I, I'm trying to think the oldest, I mean, I don't go back. I want to save Joseph and Mary for last, but I mean, the, the biggest one that comes to my mind is St. Monica. Yeah. And you do have a chapter yeah. about St. Monica I, and her, husband patricius who yeah. and i think that patricius was he baptized at the end i can't remember he, well, I, I know he, he was came, a, yeah he came back man. yeah he came back into the faith at the end so i think just you know again with monica it's it's tough with some of these older sources you can only hit so much on it right. but you know, again i think that fact with saint monica you know what she, what she told saint augustine right remember me on the altar of the lord and here all these years you know she was praying for augustine was it, i think it was like 17 and 19 years praying for him, his conversion at, at mass, pouring out her tears. And it should give all of our parents hope to, you know, that's, that's the most important place when you're at mass to, to seek the, you know, to seek our Lord's intercession um, and the saints. That's, that's great. Yeah. Just the hope of um, praying for that wayward child that uh, I know that parents like myself who are younger parents, our anxiety is, I hope that my child keeps the faith and then older parents, maybe I, I, I've spoken to so many different parents whose children have left the faith and it's such a sad reality, but St. Monica praying for 17 years and then look who St. St. Augustine became. Um, that's beautiful. Um, the, uh, the other one that I'm thinking of is um, St. I think it's St. Gregory, the theologian or AKA, um, St. Gregory of Nazianzen. Yeah. I'm pretty sure his, I they think, the, you know him, I think, I think his, oh no, his brother is St. Basil. And yeah. then um, his parents were, um, his, uh, his father was a bishop. I, I believe that back, this was back when, yeah. I, I, am I getting it right? No, you know, you are. I think, I can't think it was it Nana and there's something Nona. And I did, you know, that was, I did not include them in my book. I was like, I had so many in there and I was like, but they're definitely, you know, they had a few saints in there, but they should, if I could write a sequel to it, but since it was already 500 pages, I was like, I don't think I should add any more. Totally. Totally. Well, the, uh, we're in the Christmas season now. And of course the Holy family is the main, main, uh, show here. So, um, what, what are some of the pieces of wisdom that you see, between Joseph and Mary and the, and their parenthood and their yeah. marriage. Yeah. You know, one of the things I put in there, you know, is just the purity of St. Joseph. And, and I, I made this co comment that I think Joseph, you know, some people will take this the wrong way, but I honestly think he has his, he had a sense of a martyrdom because can you imagine being married to the most beautiful woman in the world and you cannot consummate that, that marriage, but it wasn't this like, lustful, like, oh, you know, but just, just that sacrifice. I don't think a lot of people realize that. Like that, I think honestly that I say that in the book, like, I think that makes him like one of the greatest martyr, probably the, one of the, after our lady, like the greatest martyr in a sense, because he had to die to himself so often. And so that was just an insight the Lord gave me. Now, whether that's, you know, I don't think it's a heresy, you know, it's just, you know, but <laughs> it's just, it's just some, just a beautiful thought that, you know, especially for our priests, to contemplate that thought that, you know, here you were also like, you're married to the bride, you know, you're in the church and uh, you know, in a sense, you're not physically consummating your love with the church, but, but you offer that up, you know, that, that gaze, um, that, that love to, for your bride. So that was one insight. I think another thing, 
you know, in terms of, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I, I'm mostly focused on the devotion to Joseph and Mary by these saints. So it wasn't so much, you know, in this book, I don't go into like how they raised Jesus, but I mean, just that, you know, obviously one insight too is, you know, just that the human aspect of St. Joseph where, you know, Jesus is, you know, in the middle of the night, if, you know, if he were to get you know, scared, you know, this terror of demons that Joseph, that he would come and rest on St. Joseph's chest, like, you know, and just, just hold his son. And so I think those were some, some points that I bring up, but more than anything, it was how the saints were so devoted to um, our lady and St. Joseph and, and um, you know, even the, even St. Therese, like she almost died. And it was because of St. Zelie's prayers to St. Joseph that she was, uh, that she was rescued from her illness. That's beautiful. Yeah. I, I really like, I put, I put uh, Joachim and Anne and Joseph and Mary at the beginning of this whole series, because I love, I, on the one hand, I love how Joachim and Anne give us this beautiful picture of uh, sort of what we might call a normal marriage in terms of conceiving children. Yeah. And we have the immaculate conception, but like the greatest creation that God has ever created is the blessed Virgin Mary, which came from the, the, obviously the, the uh, intimacy of two holy saints. And so the, the sort of this, this uh, this immense beauty that God creates out of uh, the gift of marital intimacy, but then you have Joseph and Mary, where it kind of goes to another level. Um, the thing that um, the thing that has really struck me when I read Calloway's book about Joseph and how he he introduces he advocates well, as you said, he advocates the young Joseph theory first of all uh, <laughs> that Joseph was younger, and so that's why that sacrifice of having this Josephite marriage, the original Josephite marriage is so much greater. Uh, but also he, he talks about how um, he advocates uh, what's known, I think sometimes as the reverence theory mm -hmm. um, describing why Joseph was going to divorce Mary mm -hmm. uh, in that he, he found out that she had conceived of the Holy ghost and he was going, she was going to bear a son. And then he was going to divorce her because was and he was going to do it quietly one because uh he didn't he wanted to do it quietly because he didn't want anyone to falsely accuse the virgin mary of adultery because he knew that was uh totally false and mm -hmm. he he would rather die than allow any dishonor to this woman that was you know perfect most beautiful woman and then the secondly he wanted to divorce her not because he was uh you know forsaking his duties or anything but he was saying well i'm i'm unworthy I'm totally unworthy to take her. Uh, who am I to take her? And that's why the angel says, do not be afraid to take her as your wife because of this conception that's miraculous. You will name him uh, Jesus, meaning you're the father. You're going to be the father. You're going to you're going to name him Jesus. So I, I found that to be very powerful for me in just being a husband and father. Um, any further thoughts on Joseph or Mary, Patrick? Yeah. Yeah, and I love that part about Father Calloway when he mentioned about the reverence theory. And, and I've read too, right, that Joseph, even as a youth, kind of he pledged his virginity to God and same with Our Lady. And so, you know, that that would have been, that 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 action would have been totally reasonable. And, you know, I, I think that there is, there's this, this reverence, you know, that Joseph's in the presence of Our Lady, you know, the Holy of Holies, you know, and, and for him, you know, I, I can't imagine you know, the joy and then also like that responsibility, you know, like, you know, as, as fathers, you know, when we find out our wife's pregnant, you know, it's like, we're so excited, but then there's also like, you know, it just, you know, like as things go, as you um, progress in life and you, you know, you start to work, it's, it's easier when, when you're a single guy and you have nothing to worry about, it's, oh, you lose your job or, but then when you're married and I mean, there's just, it's like, you have little, little mouths to feed. I mean, there's just a lot of, a lot of suffering but I think when we look at Joseph, you know, the man of, he was essentially, I was telling my wife this too. It's like, he was like a man of poverty, but yet he had everything, you know, everything in, in Jesus and our lady. And, and, and I think that's, that's an example for, for me, you know, as I live, like to, to not seek the treasures that are on earth, but the treasures in heaven. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we could all, we're just, we could spend a lifetime drawing the riches out of the Holy family. Um, well, Patrick, thank you so much for writing this book. 
Um, it's really an exciting text, a very important text for our time, of course, family. Um, there's just so many, there's so many saints who have been canonized, uh, and the vast majority of them are are not married. And seeing the fact that so much of their holiness has been uh, guide, guided to them by their parents, I think this is uh, so important and gives us all hope as lay people that we can we can uh, achieve holiness and help others help our children achieve holiness. Um, last question for you. Um, what are some things that have really challenged you personally? Um, any particular wisdom that uh, has really helped you with I, I love that you started writing this book three months into marriage. That's just <laughs> that's, I love that. It's like, yeah, let's let's just figure out how to be this husband and father. So uh, tell us about uh, anything you've learned that you've really want to impart or share with the viewers. Yeah. Well, I had a priest once tell me, you know, because yeah, I mean, when you read these saints and, you know, you, you're kind of, you you have this ideal of what saint, you know, sanctity looks like from them. And like these saints, you know, a lot of them, right. They never committed a mortal sin. They, you know, they went to mass every day. They're just, you know, all this, and it's not necessarily all true there, right? I mean, there's there's some great sinners that became great saints. And this priest told me once, you know, and so that can feed this level of perfectionism. And uh, I was told recently uh, by this priest is like, you know, God loves you, like loves your weaknesses even more than your strengths. And like, you know, our brokenness. And often it's, you know, I, I think it's just coming to this point where, so that, that was one thing that kind of struck me, you know, just this, you know, just God, like these are my weaknesses and, you know, you're using these weaknesses for your glory and for my humility. And then another thing in this book was, um, you know, Maximilian Colby's mother, people found out later, like about her son and they would come into her and said, like, what did you do to raise a saint? And she said, it was a quote, something like this. It's like, I saw my inadequacy. And I begged the mother of God to, to supply for my weaknesses. And I, you know, and I, I think as fathers, and we often think that we have to figure this out, but really our children belong to God, you know, and God created them with their temperaments, with their strengths and weaknesses. And, and we often, so I, I think just something that's occurred to me, like a revelation is like, Lord, like this is, you know, my son is your son and, you know, like help me, to raise him like an our lady, like this is your child and give me like the insight, the wisdom to raise them how you want them, not how I want them. So those are a couple points that I think have really, um, God's kind of shown me the other day that I don't need to figure this out, but, you know, give me the wisdom, you know, because they belong to you and they're, they need to. And, and finally, more than anything, our Lord wants saints. This is what he wants from us as parents. Nothing else matters. It doesn't matter if our children, get into this college, but really, or have this successful career, but I have a short window. I have 18 years with my children and to not waste that time. Um, it's going to go by fast, but to treasure every moment with my children and to really show them. And uh, my final point I'm wrapping up is affection for children. I've seen that in the, all these parents, the life of, you know, Lewis and Zelie Martin and uh, Thomas Moore, to love your children, you know, love them, uh, and, and show that love, uh, and that will raise the saint. Excellent. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, very exciting, very exciting to discuss parenthood, parenting the saints with you, Patrick. So, well, with that, let's, let's ask our blessed mother for some help to do this. We'll close it out. And, uh, we'll, so we'll pray a hail Mary, and then we're going to invoke our, uh, lay patrons for our lay apostolate. Uh, click the link below to purchase Patrick's book, Parents of the Saints. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Victory. Pray for us. Mary, Queen of the Home, pray for us. Saint Joseph, Terror of Demons, pray for us. Saint Anthony of the Desert, pray for all clergy and seminarians. In the name of the Father, 
Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is King. Amen.